Hello, I'm Anne Sanciolo representing Gallery Elysium and today I'm speaking with Hank Eaves, a long-time dealer, art lover, collector of Indigenous art. Hank is the managing director of the Emily Museum at Cheltenham, Victoria, which is dedicated to the works of probably our most significant female Australian painter, Emily Kame Nyangawade. So we're here in this converted factory where Hank houses his extensive collection to discuss the forthcoming exhibition to be shown at Gallery Elysium in Hawthorne, titled Emily and Friends. All the works in this exhibition have been selected by Hank Eaves from his collection of top tier contemporary Australian art and will include some works that have never previously been exhibited. Hank, I know that you were born in the Netherlands and that you travelled and lived extensively overseas. Where does this love of art come from? I have absolutely no idea. I think, I think the Dutch have an enormous love for art because they spent most of their time inside. Like, you know, it's too cold, too wet, so you, know, you have to have a hobby uh, that you can do inside the house. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's, they live inside and they leave the curtains open. And when you go to Holland, you see the living rooms are literally stacked. I mean, the paintings hang about you know, five centimeters away from each other until the place is full. Uh, so um, I guess it's something that you're born with. Yeah, part of your cultural heritage, I guess. Uh, yes, partly. Um, my father, uh, I never knew him very well. And um, he had his own sort of um, decor, uh, which I, I liked, but I think the only painting that I really liked was the painting that represented the ship, the Anna Jacoba. Um, it was a three master that my great grandfather was the captain on. Okay. And so that appealed to my sense of, you know, travel and, 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 uh, thinking that one day I would go and travel around the world, which I ended up doing. And I got stuck in Australia, which is fabulous because it's right on the other side. <laughs> so I've got the best of both worlds. What drew you to Indigenous art in particular? I lived in Darwin. Um, when I left uh, Canberra, um, after a few months of running a hotel in Canberra uh, as the assistant manager, I drove my 1949 Sunbeam Talbot into the desert and ended up in Darwin. <laughs> Couldn't go any further. Um, and then um, became a, an orderly and an assistant pathologist. And I also jumped out of airplanes up there in order to go and help farmers that had an emergency if you couldn't reach them during the wet season. And that was the beginning of my flying career. I then moved down to Melbourne, became a commercial pilot and you know, the rest is history. Uh, a mixture of different hobbies that became businesses uh, when they were no longer small enough to be called a hobby. So here you are in Cheltenham with your wonderful collection. How many of these pieces would you say you've collected over the years? I have no idea. Um, in the paintings I know because um, my staff, we, we operated out of art galleries in the city uh, when I had bought too many to keep at home. So the first thing that had to happen is I had to, um, you know, my, when my house was filled up, um, I had to find another place. So the best thing to do is to, you know, first you find a warehouse and then you decide what uh, some of the paintings that I duplicated um, would probably be better off sold so that I could then buy another one. Because as you learn, you also learn to become more critical about what you've bought in the first place. And so I started um, an art gallery having absolutely no idea what that entailed, but it went broke. It was an antique print gallery in Turek, and that was my first sort of uh, foray into the art world. Before that, I was making furniture uh, because I couldn't afford to buy it, so I thought, make it and then sell a few and so on and so on. And how did Emily come into your life? <laughs> By accident. <laughs> um, I went to an art gallery um, the, um, the Gabriella Pizzi Gallery was the first that exhibited some of her work that came from uh, Delmore Downs, uh, which was the location where her uh, language group, um, they're not you know, called tribes, uh, and Emily and her family uh, were from what was called Utopia. And so uh, they spoke and Mitchell Yaura 
and there were probably about 600 family members that were living on that property and they started producing art when they saw the success story of Papanya Tula, which was the first community in the central and western desert and that was uh, you know, in, uh, involved with creating superb art under the guidance of uh, Jeff Barden and it all started in 1971. Can you give us some background on Emily? It's a fabulous story. It is a fabulous story. I mean, it's almost hard to believe that uh, Australia's most famous and best known artist, she holds the record for one of her paintings at the moment at 2.1 million uh, at auction. So that wasn't the fluke. Emily started painting late in life. She was 79 years old. And she was a Stone Age nomad before that. She had no concept of of our world. She had never sat in a car until she was 50 years old. And, and when they finally hit the bitumen on the way to Alice Springs, she said, oh, look, we're riding on blankets because <laughs> that's all she'd ever seen covering the desert. Um, and she started working um, with um, Delmore Downs, um, the whole family. And they had experience selling Aboriginal art because uh, the, uh, the wife, um, Janet Wilson, she had works with Papanyatula, the first uh, group of uh, Aboriginal artists set up by Jeff Barden back in 1971, which was the beginning of Aboriginal art as we know it. So it's, it's virtually um, you know, 50 years uh, next year um, that, that Aboriginal art has made an impact on the world, which is amazing along it the is. lines of the Impressionist movements uh, of France and the New York School in New York. Um, and it's growing day by day. Uh, we now have exhibitions in New York and Los Angeles, and every country has had an Aboriginal art exhibition, including the one that I did in Holland, the first Emily exhibition in 1999. I only met her because a very nice guy walked into my gallery and said, I'd, I'm looking for a distributor for my grandmother's paintings, and I'm going, when you've got a Greek grandmother and you're walking to, and he goes, well, yeah, I mean, I'm part Greek, but uh, you know, my grandmother is Emily, and I'm going, Emily who? And he says, Emily Ann Worry, and I'm going, you're kidding. I said, I know your mom, Barbara Weir. So we got along straight away, because Barbara had been working for me for about four or five years, one of the first artists. And, um, and he said, well, you know, the Aboriginal artists are getting ripped off and I want to find somebody who is willing to do the right thing. And I said, well, you know, she's, to my mind, one of the most brilliant artists and the most unique. 79 years old when she, you know, she mm. started. And uh, so she was still alive at this point. But she died in 86. So she, she basically painted seven, eight years. But she produced probably about 4,000 paintings. And every time we thought we'd seen what she was doing best, like color. She was a colorful you know, person uh, because she was given the paints that she could use. And then all of a sudden, as soon as we thought we had her worked out, she changed the pattern. And she went from walk lines in the desert to body paintings, which are you know, almost straight lines. First there were dotted lines, then there were straight lines. Then she went into the white yam dreamings, which is where the earth cracks up because there is something growing underneath it. And so it went on right up until the last two weeks of her life. She painted 24 paintings that were called the last series because she died. And I'll never forget the Empress of Japan looking at one of the last series that I'd lend to the government to tour around Japan and other places. And it's literally, a, it's, a, it's a small painting that we painted the background black because she likes painting on black because she's black. So if it's going to be a body painting, uh, it's a bit like makeup, you know, you will use a certain background in order to, you know, then, you know, make yourself look as good. And that, uh, Emily did exactly the same thing. So she used paint on the black background and she painted this white painting and it made no sense at all. Yeah, it makes sense if you're a Malevich or, you know, you're a Jasper Johns and you paint the white American flag and flog it for 16 million. But for Emily, who had no concept of any of that, to paint one white painting and it was her last. And I think it's because a lot of the Aboriginal artists start using black and white towards the end of their career when they've basically tried everything. And so I have a black and white painting, which was the last painting by Maxi Champ and Chimper. I'll never sell that. That has to go to a museum because I even hung it in the exhibition that I did of Emily in Amsterdam 
because it was a black and white and I hung it next to her black and white painting and both of those are in my living room upstairs. So Emily was you know, 79 when she started painting. She had never been to a museum. She had never been anywhere where she would have even have seen paintings. I mean, she always slept on the ground. Uh, she sat on, you know, on, 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 her, you know, on her legs when she was in the car. And uh, so uh, there was nothing that would predict that she would then turn out contemporary, modern, abstract art, which it's not because every painting tells a story, but in designs that you could sort of put straight into the you know, state-owned national galleries around the world um, as contemporary modern art. And the last series, of um, there is only 24 of those, and we have 10 in our collection, um, were looked at by the empress of Japan, and she said nirvana. It's the vision of what she thought heaven would look like, and I think that's pretty accurate because she died very shortly after that. Pretty astute observation. Absolutely. It also drew 106,000 Japanese art lovers because, you know, when you're the empress, you have a certain amount of, you know, pull. Tell us about the artworks at Gallery Elysium. Ailey and I decided that since he had built this brilliant art gallery, we should put some brilliant art in it. And uh, it's the beginning of his career as an art dealer. And um, he did a brilliant job on the actual gallery itself. So I thought, yeah. It'll be fun, not for the people that are going to come and look at it, but for me to be able to see some of the paintings hanging on the wall other than on my own wall. So um, we, we wandered through the place and there is probably about 2,000 paintings left out of the 14,000 that we commissioned uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, this is my 30th year in the Aboriginal art movement. And, um, and so we started, of course, with Emily because I concentrated on not selling Emily's after 19... 93, uh, but buying them back, <laughs> the ones that I had sold in the first four years of her career. And, um, and that was a good idea because you know, when you're 83, you don't know whether you're going to make 84 or 85 and living out in the desert as she was a little old lady, um, I thought there's always that possibility um, that one of these days that's going to be her last painting. And she went out with a bang. I mean, the, the, the last series of which we have 10. Of course, none of those are for sale because uh, I'm trying to organize five dedicated museums, one in each state that needs a museum of Aboriginal art. Um, and, um, and they will then get you know, the choice to have 50 Emilies and 200 other paintings from this collection uh, and, uh, and create a dedicated Aboriginal art museum, which does not exist. We tried to run one, but it was financially impossible. Which other significant artists will be represented in the exhibition? Well, of course, you know, the first three uh, are, are easy. Emily was number one. Clifford probably was number one if you were looking at it from a... I mean, they're totally different. Um, so Clifford always used to say, I'm number one. And if he saw an Emily hanging on my wall, he'd put his hand on it and he'd touch it and he'd go, is that that old lady? And I'm going, yeah, that's Emily. And he goes, I'm still number one. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the third Aboriginal artist who has sold paintings, you know, close to a million dollars a pop uh, is Rover Thomas. All three speak a different language. All three came from a totally different part in Australia, from the Kimberleys to the Central and Western Desert and so on. And so they are the three foremost artists. I think most uh, museum curators would agree with me on that one. But Emily stands out as being the most productive and most important contemporary. And in, in addition to that, it, it's a bit like, like um, uh, classical music. Um, you've got Tchaikovsky, you've got Handel. You, all men. Uh, women were really not regarded in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century uh, until now. I mean, now they're, you know, getting Nobel Prizes and, of course, it's, it's, you know, an equal playing field. But in art, it never was. And Emily, um, like Margaret Preston, was one of the rare female artists. And I think that's something that we really don't think about. But yes, I mean, in Australia, Emily is totally unique. And her, her background goes back 40,000 years. I mean, it's a pedigree that you couldn't beat with anything. I believe that if we had discovered Emily a hundred years ago, instead of in 89, 79, um, she would have done exactly the same thing. 
if you'd given her a blank piece of canvas, she would have painted it black and then produced the same paintings. And there was no, no influence from any outside source on an Aboriginal woman who was born in 1910 in the middle of you know, a desert that nobody knew about. Even Utopia had not been established at that point. It's fascinating. Unbelievable. Do you have a favorite painting in this exhibition? Yes, and that changes every day. No. <laughs> um, in the exhibition, this is a sale exhibition. So some of my favorites are not being sold because, probably because you couldn't afford them, <laughs> because they are so rare. Um, I mean, they've just sold a painting in America for $600 million. And I think that Emily is better than, you know, Salvador Mundi uh, by an artist who died in 1500. It, it's, she is totally unique. And the whole world will agree with me after I'm dead. Um, right now, they're just trying to keep the price down. But she is totally unique. Uh, and when you look at her, every year she changed her style. So when you look at the... The, the movements of what she did, uh, yes, but those are not something that you would sell from a, a, a commercial art gallery. Uh, the paintings at Elysium, uh, they range anywhere from about uh, $3,000 up to 150000 And you can only hang so many in a commercial gallery. So we've decided to pick 60 and keep moving them around. And then when they sell, we'll get more paintings in order to raise enough money. Uh, to publish catalogues and um, look after the, the paperwork required to keep the movements alive and to be able to produce more catalogues from artists like Emily and Minnie Puller and Clifford Possum and so on and so on. Uh, I need help because I no longer run a commercial gallery, uh, but I do need to have staff that can take and uh, the, the, the records, uh, the intellectual sort of property. We have more than 100,000 photographs of the last 30 years, from the first painting that I bought and the first artist that I met, all the way through to when I stopped operating commercially in the city in uh, Brook Street. That's a formidable story. And this is a, a striking collection of artworks that you have here. I'm glad you enjoy it. What are your future plans for the Emily Museum and for the collection? Well, I have a use-by date, unfortunately, and uh, so for the last 10 years, I've tried to convince the government to have one very large, very expensive $300 million museum completely built in the style of Emily by somebody like Zaha Hadid. Unfortunately, she died on me. And, um, and after that, it was all downhill. I could not find any support See, we kept changing prime ministers, so by the time I got to know them, they were gone. Uh, they hung around for a couple of years and then they were replaced and so on. And their last sort of, you know, port of call was not building a museum for Aboriginal art. I think it was a major mistake. Aboriginal art is a contemporary modern art movement. It, it beats the New York School in some of the successes that it's had in the last 50 years. Uh, the variety is staggering. Uh, they keep coming up with new artists. The New York School only lasted for five to ten years. People like um, Jackson Pollock and, and Rothko. And now Rothko you know, is, costs something like you know, three or five or ten million dollars. And Jackson Pollock's blue poles that everybody laughed about is now worth 200 million. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's very difficult to convince a government that are basically there to run the country, uh, to look at the priorities. Nobody's going to remember Australia or any other country for its uh, financial success in terms of how they, they run the place. Um, but it's the art that is uh, basically uh, the identity of the country that you go and visit. You go to Italy for uh, the buildings and the art, and you go to Holland for the clogs and the tulips, and, and you go to other countries that all have their, uh, their stamp on culture. And Australia's original art is Aboriginal, no matter how you look at it. For the last 240 years, we've had a, a large number of brilliant artists that have come from overseas as migrants. But Aboriginal art is absolutely and totally unique. And we will ultimately all identify ourselves, especially if you have spent uh, one or two generations uh, becoming part of Australia, uh, then you no longer question uh, where the, the culture came from. Um, 
So um, my my intention is is to before I you know kick the bucket uh, is to find a place uh, to uh, allow people to wander um, into uh, a dedicated Aboriginal art museum, not with boomerangs, not with clapping sticks, not with uh, bark paintings, but contemporary modern art stuff that you would hang in your living room because it brightens up your day and makes your heart beat, beat faster. So I think there is five states that desperately need uh, a dedicated museum and those are the states that don't have already um, got a lot of uh, museums like Canberra doesn't need another one and Tasmania has got one that's doing very well. Same with the Northern Territory. But I do believe that Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, all we need is an old government building that can be restored. All you need is walls painted in any colour, Aboriginal art looks fabulous on red or on black or whatever. And, uh, and I can split up the collection that I have into five equal collections of about 250 paintings. That's all you need. They started at the Vincent van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam in 1975 with 204 because the director came here and said, that's what you should be doing. And I agree with them. So um, at the moment I'm negotiating with a number of um, large uh, provincial towns like Ballarat, uh, Fremantle, Wollongong, uh, to have a look at the possibility of getting them to take one of the museums and fund it and then run it as a, an umbrella company. See, this painting behind me is five meters high and 15 meters long. So it can tour, it, it, you know, you need the destination painting. You, mm -hmm. If you go to Amsterdam, you go and look at the Night Watch. If you go to Paris, you go and look at the you know, Mona Lisa. And, and uh, I have enough and, you know, paintings uh, that would draw an art lover to just travel an hour from Melbourne to Ballarat or an hour or half an hour from, from Perth to Fremantle to go and have a look at art that is absolutely and totally unique in this world and of this country. You can't find it anywhere else. The original art comes from Australia and it's the country that we chose to live in, so it's the country that we should basically embrace for its cultural brilliance as well, because it's already been proven to be internationally popular. Uh, paintings are being sold regularly by Sotheby's, half a million, 300,000, 400,000, and they're painted by people that walked out of the desert in 1984. Think about it. My daughter was already 10 years old at that point, and they had never seen an art gallery, they'd never seen a painting. They walked out of the desert, not knowing that they had been invaded a couple of hundred years earlier. And, uh, and they're now superstars, and they've flown to New York and Los Angeles and Europe, all over the world, right, to see their own exhibitions hanging on, on hallowed walls of major museums. So um, that's what I'm working at, uh, and uh, at least I'll start it. Whether I can finish it, that's something that I can't, I can't guarantee. Well, we certainly hope Absolutely. that you do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Hank, you're to be congratulated for your passion and your tireless advocacy of Indigenous art. The Emily and Friends exhibition at Gallery Elysium will be a wonderful opportunity for investors and art lovers to view and celebrate the diversity and brilliance of Emily's work. And it's going to be in one of Melbourne's most exciting new galleries. We hope to see everyone there.